Uh, testing again. Are we good? Okay. Okay. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. This is my first time at GGI, so I'm very pleased to be here. So I've been asked to give you five lectures about dark matter. So the allocation here is going to be the first lecture is what we know about dark matter, and then the next four lectures are going to be what we don't know about dark matter and how we might figure it out. Theoretic so lecture one, this is going to be on what we know about dark matter and the gravitational probes of dark matter. So the goals that we hope to get through today is by the end of today, if you follow the lecture, you shall be able to explain the evidence for dark matter, explain what we mean by dark matter. You'll see that our evidence is that dark matter is approximately cold and approximately collisionless. So I want you to be able to tell me what those two things mean and related to this, summarize so I'll say estimate the limits on dark matter being warm or having interactions. So when I write DM in this context, I will always mean dark matter. And I want you to and I want to also just be able to summarize gravitational probes of dark matter properties. So the zeroth order picture is through evidence that we'll talk about in this lecture. We believe that about five-sixths of the matter in the universe and about 25% of the critical density is composed of the stuff that we call dark matter. You could instead call it transparent matter or clear matter since we believe that light is not absorbed or reflected by dark matter, but essentially just passes straight through it. Um, we don't know what this is. We know quite a bit about what it's not. We know that no particle in the standard model provides a good explanation for what dark matter might be. And so it's often raised as one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for new physics beyond the standard model. So far, every piece of information that we have about dark matter is either a null result or it comes from gravitational probes of dark matter. From We know that dark matter gravitates by looking at its gravitational influence on visible matter, on stars, on gas clouds, on galaxies, on, um, on, on the evolution of matter perturbations in the early universe, we can, we, we can say quite a bit about its properties. So today's lecture is going to be about this positive evidence for what we know about dark matter. So, and as I go, please feel free to ask questions. Okay, so I want to start by just talking about what the history of dark matter is. Where, when did we first become aware that this was a potential issue, and how did we learn about it? So this historical review is going to start back in the 1920s, 1930s, when people are starting to realize that in several locations in the universe, it, there appeared to be more gravitating matter than could be accounted for by simply adding up the luminous objects that we could see. So in particular, I want to give you an example of an analysis done by Fritz Zwicky in 1933, where what he was trying to do was to estimate the mass of a galaxy cluster called the Coma Cluster. And so analyses like this today, where we try to measure the mass of an object and work out what we call its mass to light ratio, how much total mass there is versus how much luminous matter there is, today also provide a probe of um, where the dark matter is located in the universe. Now, anytime you're trying to estimate some new quantity from data, it's ideally good to have a couple of different methods, do the calculation a couple of ways, check that you get the same answer both ways. So Zwicky, was doing this. His method one was to count the number of galaxies in the cluster, um, add up the total luminosity. So this gave him, a, gave him a measure of the total luminosity of the cluster, 
but then he wanted to convert that to an estimate of the mass in the cluster. So for that, he used a mass to light ratio that was based on observations of local of the local um, captain stellar system. This is saying, okay, we think these galaxies are roughly this bright. We'll guess that they have roughly this much mass. So, and his original numbers were that there were about 800 galaxies in coma. He estimated that each of them, that it, most of the, that the average galaxy was around 10 to the 9 solar masses. So this symbol M with a little dot after it means the mass of the sun. We're commonly going to use that as a mass unit when we talk about galaxies in the present day. Our Milky Way galaxy is about 10 to the 12 solar masses. So, and then he said, okay, so this total mass, if we wanted to measure this in grams, this is going to give us a total mass of about 800 times 10 to the 9 times the conversion factor from, let's, if we wanted to write it in grams or something, then we'd say... So this is like 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 9 times 2 times 10 to the 33 grams is about a solar mass. The sun is about 10 to the 30 kilos. And this gives you a mass of about 2 times 10 to the 45 grams. Okay, so cool. That's method one. We've got an estimate of the total mass of this cluster. Method two... So this is like a, this is a census method. This is like, you know, trying to figure out the mass of our solar system by looking at the planets and adding up the mass of the planets, trying to estimate the mass of the asteroids that we can see. But you might worry that there are things that we're missing in this. Maybe your calibration is off. Maybe there are objects that are not radiating brightly in the frequencies that you can see. Maybe there's other stuff in there. So method two is, well, we know something that probes mass directly, and it's gravity. So, Method two was to just look at the velocities of some objects in the cluster. So he has a me had a measurement of eight galaxies. He measured their velocities just using Doppler shifts and estimated that the typical velocity dispersion of objects in this cluster was about 1,000 kilometers per second. Now, the modern value is like 1,082 kilometers per second. So this was actually a pretty good measurement. Then he said, okay, this is a galaxy cluster. It's a bunch of different galaxies. It's a relaxed system. It's been there for a long time. So let's assume that everything is in equilibrium. So in that case, we can use this virial theorem, which relates the, kinetic the total kinetic energy of the system to its gravitational potential energy. So this is just assuming that um, these galaxies have been there for a long time. They're just all in some equilibrium within this gravitational potential. That tells you that the kinetic and potential energy are of the same order. There's, there's a factor of a half. The potential energy for this system, you can model... You, you end up modeling as just, just gm squared over r times some conversion factor, where m is the total mass of the galaxy cluster. It's just this self-gravitating system. So that gives us an estimate. So we need to know the approximate radius, the approximate vir virial radius. You can measure that just by measuring how far out the galaxies are. So for this, and for this system, this comes out to be about 10 to the 6 light years. So let's do a little, let's do a little bit of unit conversion here. Um, we look at, uh, we say the radius of coma, so one light year. So the speed of light is, anyone want to tell me the speed of light in centimeters per second? Check if you're awake. So it's three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So yeah, um, sure, we can, we can do it in meters per second. We're going to, so it's three times 10 to the eight meters per second times one year. Anyone know roughly how many seconds there are in a year? Sorry, times 10 to the what? Five. Yep, that's right. Good. One year. Yeah, this is my favorite mnemonic. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, no, it's really good. It's like 3.14 something times 10 to the 7 second. <laughs> okay, so 
pi times 3 is 10. We all know that, right? So, um, okay. So this is like 10. So this is... Okay, so this is roughly 10 to the 16 meters. So if you take your value of G in SI units and you take your value of, um, so we're going to set this equal to um, two times the kinetic energy. So this is like M V squared. So we're going to, um, so, so from this, we can infer what M is, just cancel these m's, will, m will just be like v squared r over g times some prefactor. If we put in g, then what we end up with is like 3 times 10 to the 47 grams. Now, so these numbers are different by about two orders of magnitude. So this is not, so, so this should worry you a little bit. I mean, you can go through, you can check out the uncertainties. It turns out, so the second answer, greater. Okay. You can do this a little bit more carefully. Um, Zwicky's original answer was actually about a factor of 400 because um, he messed up the so you know you were talking about the Hubble parameter h. So Wiki had the wrong number for the Hubble parameter, and so he thought the coma cluster was at a different distance than it actually is when he was you know, basing this off his redshift. So he got about 400. If you put in all the modern values, you get about 50 instead of about 100. All the modern values for these inputs. But basically, it's a two order of magnitude discrepancy. So this tells you that just adding up all the luminous matter in the galaxy is apparently only getting you about 1% of the total mass. And Zwicky, in his paper, said, well, so this is potentially evidence for some kind of dark matter, that's his wording, um, that is not being accounted for in this luminosity sum. At the time, he wasn't thinking of this in terms of a puzzle of fundamental physics. He was thinking about this in terms of, oh, you know, maybe there are burnt out old stars, chunks of rock, stuff that is not just not glowing, at least in the at least in the energies that I'm looking at. And for about 40 more years, that was where the field of dark matter discussions stood. But this analyses like this were the first clue. And the analog of this today is that now we believe that, uh, that the vast majority of galaxies and galaxy clusters have clouds of dark matter surrounding them, which in many cases, which in most cases will actually make up most of the mass of those systems. Any questions about, th any questions about this before I go on to what happened in the 1970s? I guess I'll delete this so that... Okay, it's just a simple analysis which says there appears to be more in the universe visible by gravity than visible through visible matter. Okay, so what happened in the 1970s? The next big development was analyses of rotation curves. this was the next development in this mystery. So if the dark matter was burnt out stars, chunks of rock and so on, and that was 99% of the mass in our galaxy, you might still expect it to be broadly distributed like the visible stars in our galaxy. So we live in the Milky Way. I don't know how many of you have ever been somewhere where you can see the Milky Way as a stripe of stars across the sky. Okay, so a couple of you. So if you stand on Earth and you look up at the sky from the right points on Earth, you can see this band of stars sweeping across the sky. That reflects the fact that you know, if you approximate our, our galaxy is this spiral galaxy, which I can't draw, we're sitting out on one of these spiral arms. So this is Earth. We're about eight kiloparsecs, which is about... Um, so I'm going to be using units of, a kilo, of kiloparsecs and megaparsecs and parsecs often, so one parsec 
is um is is about is, is hang on, let me just check that I'm doing this right. Uh, yeah, one parsec is about three light years. So we are about 8.5 kiloparsecs from the center of our galaxy, so that's about 25,000 light years away from the galactic center. So most of the stars in the galaxy lie in, these, in, the, in the disk, in particular in these spiral arms, and in a sort of bulge of stars at the center of our galaxy that extends roughly about one kiloparsec, so you know, a few thousand light years out from the galactic center. So that's our galactic geography. So, and if you stand on Earth and look up at the sky, then there's, yeah, so we, we live in a disk, which is the band of stars that you can see when, uh, when you look at the Milky Way. Now, so if the dark matter was just ordinary matter that wasn't shining for some reason, you might expect it similarly to be distributed like this disk and like this bulge. So one thing, so another measurement of the gravitational pull of our galaxy and the mass of our galaxy is you can say, okay, let's suppose we look at an object like the Earth, but a bit brighter, so pick a star or pick a gas cloud that is radiating brightly, that is rotating around our galaxy with some velocity v. And if I want to measure the mass in our galaxy, then what I can do is measure the velocity. It's just like Zwicky, except that now instead of just looking at average velocity over the whole cluster, I'm interested in velocity as a function of distance from the center. And that will tell me how much enclosed mass there is as a function of distance from the center. Okay, so like V of R is what I want to measure here. So this is called a, so, so this is called, so a rotation curve is a measure of rotational velocity versus as a function of distance from the center of the system. So what would you expect if, let's suppose, let's suppose it's just a simple example. Suppose most of the gas, the matter in, the mass in our galaxy was concentrated in this central bulge at the middle. So, and let's assume that we're looking at, we're looking at rotational velocities outside this central bulge. So if, so if, mass is concentrated in a central region. So like just doing Newtonian gravity, I don't care if you've taken GR or not for these purposes, gravity is pretty weak here on the scales that we're looking at. So we're just going to use Newtonian gravity. Um, how would I expect the rotational velocity to vary as a function from the center in that case, if I'm looking at radii outside this concentrated central region? Yeah, so, so, right, so I, um, sorry, do you want to say, just say that a bit louder? Centripetal, yep, so I've got a centripetal force, centripetal force, which is like V squared, well, it's like MV squared over R, right? And I'm going to equate this to the gravitational force, which is like GMM over R squared. Well, yeah, this is not a tilt, this is actual inequality. Okay, so I'll cross off the masses, I'll get V. So I'll cancel out the powers of R, so I should get V is proportional to 1 over root R, right? And the normalization of this will tell me capital M. So what I'd expect to see for my rotation curve in this case is something that, something that looks like this, okay? So just a what 1 over square root R dependence. So now, it's not quite that simple because this galaxy has spiral arms as well. You know, it's not a perfectly spherically symmetric system. So people had worked out, okay, let's look at the visible matter and just compute the gravitational potential from that, work out what V should look like as a function of R. So this is an example from um, a particular galaxy that was looked at around this time. It was NGC 3196. And so they figure that, you know, when you're in the center of the bulge, the V should rise as a function of R, and then it should fall off and gradually decrease like this. And just for your calibration, this maximum velocity was like 
130 kilometers per second. Escape velocity from our galaxy is about 500 kilometers per second. This will be important later when we talk about direct detection of dark matter. So, you know, and then this is at like, in this particular system that they looked at, this was like, this was like RM kiloparsecs. So this was the kind of behavior that you expected to see. At large R, it was this one over square root R behavior. At small R, it depended on the structure of the bulge and the disk. This is toy model. So this is EG. Okay, but, so, okay, so this is how we think the world should work, just based on Newtonian gravity and knowing where the visible matter is. But in the 1970s and 80s, Vera Rubin and Ford and Thonard studied quite a wide range of systems, and what they found was that instead, the curves tended to look something like this. Now, so as expected, the, the velocity rose as you went out from the very center, as you went to the region, this will matter is, but then they just flattened out. So I mean, let's, let's just do the same sort of simple spherically symmetric estimate that we did here. If you're telling me empirically that, that this is, that, um, so this is, this is the relationship where capital M here is now the enclosed mass within radius R. If you want V to be constant, this implies that the enclosed mass within radius R should be proportional to R. So if we had a spherically symmetric system, this would tell you that the dark matter density would be approximately proportional to one over R squared, so the integral of rho. So the volume integral of this density is R squared rho dr would then be equal to, would then be just proportional to the enclosed radius. So this is saying if, so, the, so this was very controversial when it first came out. People were like, oh, you know, got, got to be an experimental error. But eventually people were convinced that this was really what was going on in the majority of galaxy systems that were observed. And so then this tells you, not only is there a lot of mass that you're not seeing, it's distributed quite differently to the visible matter, because this argument didn't depend on the overall normalization, it just depended on how the, on where the matter is. So this tells you that these galaxies that they were looking at are surrounded by large halos of non-luminous matter that extend out well beyond the visible matter. Or alternatively, that Newtonian gravity is wrong. Okay, so these two hypotheses are the dark matter hypothesis and what's sometimes called the MOND hypothesis, which stands for modified Newtonian dynamics. Okay, so this was, as far as I can tell, the point at which the field started really taking seriously the possibility that there was dark matter, that there was a significant amount of matter out there that was dark, that was unluminous, and should have and needed to have somewhat different properties from the visible matter, because the visible matter isn't distributed like this. Um, th so whatever it is, whatever this dark stuff was, uh, would have had to have a different formation history than the visible matter, and there's likely different properties. Any questions about this so far? Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, um, it was completely arbitrary which way which way I drew these. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, it will. Like, am I? Um, so, where the direction in which we're rotating is effective. So, the way that we now think this works is that 
there's a dark matter halo, and you, so you can think, you, well, it's us rotating relative to what? So if you say, well, our galaxy of star, our disk of stars is rotating relative to the dark matter halo in which it's embedded, then that means that there's an effective wind of dark matter particles streaming into us. That wind of dark matter particles is coming from the direction of the Cygnus constellation. So if you look up at where, so if you find out where the Cygnus constellation is in the sky, then you'll know which way we are rotating towards it. But <laughs> I mean, it, it's like I mean, it's going to depend which way, which side you look at the galaxy from, right? I mean, like if I tell you that it's going this way, and then somebody looks at it from the other direction, so um, right, okay. So you just mean in the sense of do the spiral arms, uh, do the spiral arms curve in the same way that the galaxy is rotating relative to its dark matter halo? So, sorry, say again. Uh, good, good, okay. So, right, so you're, so you're saying that, um, oh, um, so I mean, I think really the configuration of these is, is like the spiral arms are tighter than I, yeah. So, um, I don't, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't remember offhand. I think the configuration of these spiral arms is somewhat tighter than I've drawn them. Like they don't really extend out a long way into the halo. Like this, this is a cartoon for illustration purposes. Okay. So I'll just say, so I just want to say a little bit about, so this was the situation in the 1970s. With, in the present day, the equivalent version of this, where we want to understand how the dark matter is distributed around galaxies is that we run large-scale simulations on computers assuming that there's some matter component which interacts only through gravity. And I'll give you the evidence for thinking that something close to that is true in a moment. You find that these simulations do a reasonably good job of explaining what we see in terms of these rotation curves, although there are some galaxies which have anomalous rotation curves and understanding exactly why that is, is ongoing, is ongoing research. So the sort of the modern upgrade of this is simulate gal galactic. And for reasons that we'll discuss a bit later in this lecture, the usual assumption is that this dark matter is non-relativistic and interacts only through gravity. And you find then that you do predict halos of dark matter surrounding the galaxies with profiles that look like, so this tells you the galaxies are embedded and DM halos with densities roughly following pro density profiles that are often called the NFW, that's for Navarro, Frank, Grat, White. So these are parametric expressions for the dark matter density profile that are just determined empirically from looking at these simulations of dark matter structure formation. So from this simple flight rotation curve estimate, I argued that you should have density scaling roughly like one over R squared. So the simulations predict that there's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, that there's an evolution in the dark matter density profile as you move from large R to um, to smaller R, but they also provide a pretty good fit to flat rotation curves in the region that people had looked over. So the NFW profile, I'm going to mention this now, define this now because it's going to come up later when we, especially when we talk about constraints on dark matter indirect searches, dark matter coll colliding with each other and making visible particles. So the NFW profile 
So this profile has rho going roughly like r to the minus 1 for small radii and roughly like r to the minus 3 at r much greater than rs. And in the intermediate region, the profile transitions between r to the minus 1 and r to the minus 3 and gives you a pretty good match to observed rotation curves. And the Inastro profile, and this RS is a scale radius that is different for each galaxy. It just depends on how big the galaxy is. And then the Inastro profile similarly has an evolution. Where R minus, where r minus 2 and rho minus 2 here just mean the radius at which the logarithmic slope of this profile is 2, so the radius at which it's going like rho goes like 1 over r squared. So it's like the scale radius for the NFW case. And empirically, this parameter alpha is adjustable, and it depends somewhat on the size of the galaxy. But from simulations, alpha is about 0.17 for Milky Way-sized halos. So these are both cases where the profile around the scale radius is which um, corresponds to about 20 kiloparsecs for the Milky Way, so a bit further out than our location. At the scale radius, they're roughly out of the minus 2 profiles. At smaller radii, the density is flatter than that, so it flattens out towards the center, which is good because if it was really out of the minus 2 all the way in, then that would not be particularly physical. Um, and then at larger radii, it, uh, it steepens which means that it is reasonable to talk about these confined bound halos. So this is our picture of the cosm of the, the local part of the universe today, that galaxies and galaxy clusters are embedded in large halos of dark matter that we can't see. There's generally more dark matter towards the center of these systems. These profiles rise monotonically with larger R. Um, and these dark matter halos tend to dominate the total mass of these systems, although the degree to which they dominate depends on what kind of system you're looking at. Now, there's a caveat here, which is that we don't... These analyses are based on simulations. Those simulations have a limited resolution. They can't probe really small scales around the centers of galaxies. And it's really hard to measure dark matter rotation curves as you go in close to the center of galaxies, because in the centers of galaxies, there's a lot of ordinary matter. So you may be able to measure the total, you may be able to measure the total mass. You can look at how fast objects are going, and that tells you how much total contained mass there is. But if 99% of that matter is ordinary stars, then you're going to have a pretty large error bar on the 1% of stuff that's left over. So it is difficult to predict what the dark matter density should be doing towards the very center of these systems, and it's also pretty hard to measure it analytically. But there are some observations which suggest that, this, that these profiles don't work very well towards the centers of halos. This is, yeah, this is by running large M body simulations, looking at, so in those simulations, you have a, you can measure the density of dark matter halos as a function of R down to some radius where you lose resolution. And then it's, yeah, it's, it's just saying, okay, let's, let's take these profiles, let's try to fit a simple parametric form to them. Um, They are, so this is something that you, so they roughly depend on how large the halo is. So rho naught will set the overall mass in, so I mean, t some combination of them will set the overall mass of dark matter in the galaxy. For a given galaxy, you would generally just try to measure these parameters. 
but you so RS like for Milky Way size galaxies this is typically going to be in the tens of kiloparsec range for um, dwarf galaxies it might be in the one kiloparsec range these are basically just measures of the size and mass of the galaxy yeah so alpha so in the inastro profile I think there there is some ev evidence of evolution with alpha as you change in halo mass as well but this is all this is all based on simulations and as we'll, as we'll talk about later, there can, especially if you want to look at very small halos, there can be pretty substantial uncertainties in extrapolating from the simulations. Because the way that these simulations are actually done is essentially you, you take a bunch of dark matter particles at early stages and then you evolve them forward in time. But when we say dark matter particles here, we, mean, we often mean things that are 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 solar masses. Because if you try to model dark matter particles that are even one solar mass, then the computational burden just becomes impossible. So for the purposes of these simulations, like a black hole is a particle. <laughs> a star is a particle. Yep. So, right, so, so actually, if you take this Inastro profile with Alfred, like for the Milky Way, you put in the numbers that I just told you for the Milky Way, and you ask what do these density profiles look like as a function of R, they look basically identical except at the very center. So, I mean, because they're both being matched to the same data, <laughs> pretty much. So, um, so you know, I mean, if you look at this on a log plot, the NFW profile will be like R to the minus one, and then sloping to R to the minus three at large R, where this is, RS, the Inastro profile ends up, you know, like it looks, it ends up looking something like this. The Inastro tends to be a little bit shallower than the NFW at the very small radii. Like it, it evolves towards, like as R goes to, um, as, yeah, as, as R goes to zero, it just evolves towards a constant, whereas the NFW evolves towards R to the minus one. So the Inastro is a little bit flatter in the center. So these differences can be important if you're trying to example to look for signals of dark matter particles colliding with each other and making visible particles coming from the galactic center. Then the difference between these profiles can be orders of magnitude. But it's also possible that if you're looking towards the very center, then the correct profile looks something like this and isn't one of these two profiles at all. Because any of these profiles, if you talk about them in the very centers of galaxies, you're just doing an extrapolation. Sorry, so I'm saying in the context of these simulations, you're, you're, you're doing a, you're, you're modeling the dark matter as a bunch of individual particles that interact with other particles only through gravity, okay? Now, you have a choice to make here, which is, this is basically a resolution choice, which is how heavy are your other individual particles that you're going to simulate? To what scale are you going to track the behavior of different dark matter particles, okay? Now, the trade-off here is that if you go down to particles that are 1 GeV each, then you have a truly colossal number of particles in your simulation, and it's just not computationally feasible. I mean, you might have better resolution, but you can't do it practically. So I think this current state-of-the-art simulations, the, uh, so this also, there's also a difference here. Do you want to try to simulate a cosmological simulation? So you're taking into account the full expansion of the universe. You're taking into account many, many galaxy clusters and galaxies. Or do you want to do a zoom-in simulation where you really just look at the evolution of like one galaxy and you assume that nothing is coming in from outside your box? So the former case is what you need to do if you're trying to simulate like the whole local volume. But the latter case, people often do that so that they can go for higher resolution. They can include more particles that, and, and so that they can try to get better estimates of like, what the density would do towards the center of, say, a Milky Way-sized halo. So you, you have these trade-offs to make where basically the trade-off is our level of detail versus how much time does it take. Because these simulations take a long time to run. So if you, know, if, there's a if you can say, oh, this simulation would be amazing, it would give us fantastic sensitivity to the smallest scales, it will take 100 years to run using uh, half the computing power of the world, then that's not really in practice a very useful simulation. So the Milky Way, the best simulations that I'm aware of, you can get the density profile into about one or two kiloparsecs from the sender before you start really being limited by resolution. It's it. So 
I, I may be a little bit out of date on this. Um, at least a couple of years ago, the best simulations, the masses of the dark matter particles were like 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4 solar masses. So in a Milky Way sized halo, which is 10 to the 12 solar masses, that means, you, I mean, that means you've got a billion particles in your simulation. So there is some observation. So okay, so there is some observational evidence, some observational hints that these profiles are not good matches to all galaxies at small scales. So these are collectively called the small scale problems of CDM. And broadly speaking, the hints are that so these are in general discrepancies between simulation predictions and observation. Okay, so, and the general picture here is that the simulations making this assumption that the dark matter is extremely non-relativistic and its interactions are purely gravitational, si simulations tend to um, Overpredict the density of DM on fairly small scales. So this is not a resolution issue now. This is issues where this is an area where you think the simulation should be pretty reliable, but the simulation but the simulations do not seem to be agreeing with the observations. So by small scales here, I mean generally less than about 10 kiloparsec. So there's a good review of this. I'm only going to be able to give a fairly cursory description of these in the time that we have available. So I'm just going to point you to this review from about six months ago. So this is by Bullock and Boylan Colchin, and it's a good up-to-date review on these small-scale problems of CDM. But broadly speaking, this is, this is the issue. So these problems, there are a few. There's the too big to fail problem, which basically said, and relatedly, the cusp core problem. This basically says that if you look at galaxies somewhat smaller than the Milky Way, so comparable to the dwarf satellite galaxies at the Milky Way, then one way to say this So with stellar masses in sort of the 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9 solar mass range. Seem to be less concentrated. Than predicted. And in particular, rather than rising pretty steeply with this 1 over R profile towards the origin, as you'd expect from NFW, or even the more shallower cusps that you get from ANASTO, we'd, um, there's some evidence for cause There's some evidence that at relatively small scales between, you know, about a kiloparsec or um, 100 parsecs, then the density profile flattens out to a greater degree than you would expect from there. So that's called the cusp core problem, where cusp is the steep rise towards the center that you expect with these profiles. And the core is that some of the observations seem to suggest a somewhat flatter profile towards the center. Now, the, the too big to fail problem you can tell that the paper came out around the time of the financial crisis. The, it, it looks like it may be a, ver a very similar idea, which is essentially that the Milky Way doesn't seem to have as many big, dense satellite galaxies as you would expect. 
from the M-body simulation. So these simulations predict that every galaxy or every galaxy cluster, in addition to its main dark matter halo, there should be a lot of dark matter subclumps within the main halo. As those subclumps attract stars and gas gravitationally, they form what we call satellite galaxies, or sometimes or just dwarf galaxies. Uh, in the context where, I mean, they don't necessarily have to be attached to a main halo. These clumps of dark matter with stars in them could be out there in intergalactic space as well. In which case they're called field dwarf galaxies because they're out in the field. And there's evidence from both the Milky Way satellites and from field galaxies that these dwarfs just don't seem to be as concentrated and as massive as you would expect based on the simulations. So there are, um, and again, if you're interested in following this up, come ask me, I can give you more references on the topic. So I mean, these are in principle two different problems. So it, they were called too big to fail because if the Milky Way did really have satellites this big and this dense, they're too big to fail at forming stars. So you would have expected to see them show up in observations of the stars of the Milky Way. And they don't seem to be showing up. So it's possible that these two things are disconnected to each other, but the general picture seems to be that at small scales, there's just not as much, um, there's just not as much power as you would have naively expected. There's also some claimed evidence of this kind of coring behavior in larger galaxies. So in galaxy clusters, so these are the biggest systems in the universe. In, and, in, and, in, and in galaxies, both low and high in spiral galaxies. So these papers. I am going to try to scan these lecture notes and put them online, so don't worry if you um, miss something that I'm writing down. Now, there is a, I should mention, there's a caveat here. There's a pretty long-standing debate as to whether some of these apparent cores could just be, um, could be a theoretical problem in the sense that when people are looking at the data, maybe they're putting in oversimplified models for the dark matter halos, and that is causing them to think there's a core there where there's actually not. Like, for example, people often assume that the dark matter halo is spherically symmetric, and then do the whole calculation assuming that spherical symmetry. And if it's very not spherically symmetric, then you could find that, OK, spherical symmetry with a core is a better fit to the data than spherical symmetry with a cusp. But maybe the real answer is it's something very asymmetric that has a cusp. So. I mean, of course, if it's very asymmetric, then the NFW and INASTO profiles probably aren't appropriate either. But th there are some concerns like that. But suppose you take this for granted. So, suppose you, you take this as a given. You say, all right, simulations of cold collisionless dark matter are, fine, are generally fit the data pretty well. That's already really interesting. That um, I'll talk a little bit in a moment about what happens if you try to make the dark matter more relativistic or to have big interactions that are not gravitational. But there's maybe this discrepancy on small scales. The dark matter halos are just not quite as concentrated as you would have thought. So there's a big ongoing debate at the moment about whether this would be telling us something about the properties of dark matter or whether it would just be telling us that there's a problem with our simulations. And in particular, until a few years ago, there's been a really obvious problem with most simulations in that older simulations only include dark matter and not the visible matter. And including and visible matter can have strong interactions. Visible matter can form things like stars and galaxies and supermatter and um, supernovae. So including visible matter can change the picture. So the big controversy in recent years has been 
um, is including visible matter on its own sufficient to fix all these small scale structure problems? Um, that's an ongoing debate. So there's a review, which is still, I think, pretty up to date by Brooks from 2014. So basically the picture here, I'm not gonna write everything out because this is gonna be purely in words, but basically the picture here is that once you've got visible matter, you can have events like supernovae, you can have events like outflows from the region around black holes. You can have these events which can transport a lot of gas pretty quickly over long distances. That has the effect of perturbing the gravitational potential in regions where there's a lot of visible matter. Uh, that in particular means that if you had this density profile that was steep towards the galactic center in the central region, you had a lot of dark matter that was pretty cold and pretty slow moving. So, um, and then you shake up the potential by moving a huge amount of gas out to larger radii, then that can disrupt these, that can disrupt these cusps. That can change the dark matter density in that region as the, as the dark matter density reacts to the change in the gravitational potential from the baryons. And you would expect these effects to be largest exactly where the baryon, there's more baryons than dark matter. Where, so the ordinary matter can have a big impact on the gravitational potential. Um, and that's exactly at small scales at the centers of halos, since the baryonic matter tends to be more concentrated than the dark matter. As I said, galaxies are disks of ordinary matter embedded in these large dark matter halos. So this is an ongoing dispute. So this is an, so if you could reliably simulate and control for all the effects of baryonic matter, this could potentially be a very powerful probe. These measures of the distribution of dark matter of Cori and so on could potentially be a very powerful probe of what the dark matter is doing and possible violations of those assumptions that the dark matter is extremely cold and interacts only through gravity. And so, and so let me just say a little bit about if you could do that, if you could convince yourself that visible matter was not sufficient to explain these effects, what are the other possibilities? What are some violations of the assumptions that I mentioned? Well, I said earlier that dark matter was collisionless. So why do we think this in the first place? So, let me take you back to another piece of evidence for why we think dark matter is there at all and why this is not just some modification to gravity. So in 2000, so this case really centers around this famous observation of 2006 of a system called the bullet cluster. So this announced, so I've just spent, you know, a while taking you on a tour of, okay, once you have the rotation curves, if you do similar observations today with our better observational data, what can you, what can you say? What can you learn? How can you use this as a test of dark matter properties? But back in, but if you just want to answer the question of, well, is what we're looking at dark matter or a modification to gravity, then you might think, I mean, this is, this is getting quite a long way ahead of ourselves, right? We don't even, I mean, the fact that dark matter simulations can match rotation curves pretty well is useful. But what if gravity just behaved somewhat differently on large scales than what we assume in all these simulations which are based on Newtonian gravity? The difficulty here in telling these two apart from the kind of data that I've told you about so far is that we're looking at relaxed systems, equilibrium systems where the center of the potential is where most of the dark matter piles up and it's also where most of the baryons pile up. If you see that there appears to be more mass at larger radii, then the gravitational potential is still centered in the same place and you can say, oh, maybe the potential is just not falling off as fast as we would have naively expected. So how do you distinguish these possibilities? Well, one thing that you can do is look at non-equilibrium systems. So the picture here is Look at a system of two colliding clusters. In the dark matter picture, what you have is you, you've got these, you've got these, you've got the visible matter in the clusters, 
which is gas and stars, and we know from a mass census that most of the mass is actually in, in the gas rather than in the individual stars. So you've got basically these two clouds of gas and they're moving to collide with each other. Now in the dark matter picture, around these two clouds of gas, you have large halos of dark matter. Okay, so what happens when these two things run into each other? Well, if you only have the, so what will happen to the gas clouds first? So do a little cartoon. So the gas clouds collide with each other. Now, gas is not collisionless. It's collisional. You slam these two clouds of gas into each other, they will exert pressure on each other. You will increase the temperature of the gas. They'll sort of flatten against each other. So this is time. And then eventually, they will, eventually they will end up traveling through each other, having slowed down. So temperature goes up, speed goes down. So what you'll expect to see in this case is these clouds of gas that has been heated up and they emit in x-rays. Now, if the dark matter was similarly collisional, if when you slam these two clouds of dark matter into each other, then they also slowed down and heated each other up, exerted pressure on each other, then afterwards you might expect the dark matter to similarly be distributed like the gas. But if you say, well, suppose the dark matter isn't collisional, like the gas, suppose that that's why it hasn't compacted down into a disk like the visible matter that we see has. Suppose the dark matter is just basically collisional, and I've said that if you make that assumption in embody, it's basically collisionless, it only interacts through gravity, and I've said that if you make that assumption in embody simulations, you get a pretty good match to data, then what happens here? Well, while the gas clouds are colliding, the dark matter clouds will just pass straight, will just pass straight through each other. They don't get slowed down at all. They don't get heated up at all. So then, if in this picture you were to look, so now you have quite different predictions for modified gravity and for dark matter. In the dark matter case, you predict that most of the mass of the system should be in these clouds out here, separated from the hot gas that is making these x-rays. In the modified gravity case, you say, well, all the masses in the gas, the gases in this region are in this region, so we should find that the mass is concentrated there. So you can use, so you, so x-rays tell you where the gas is. And gravitational lensing measurements tell you where the mass is. So the way that gravitational lensing works here is you look at background objects that are located behind these big, th these colliding galaxy clusters, and as light from those objects passes through this cluster, its tra trajectory will get deflected by the gravitational effects of the colliding cluster. And with a sufficiently big computer, you can reconstruct from those observations of background objects where the mass is in this system. And what you find is that the answer looks like this. The answer looks like while the glowing x-rays is coming from a region in the center of the system, most of the mass in the system is actually out here. So that gives you, so that gives you a powerful piece of evidence in favor of the dark matter interpretation and against the modified gravity interpretation, at least if you assume that there's only one kind of physics that is responsible for all the observations. If you want to say, well, there's something like dark matter that is showing up in the bullet cluster, but there's something different that is responsible for the rotation curves of galaxies, then, okay, that, that's possible. Okay. Yeah, so you could potentially have dark, so, well, so what will probably happen if the dark matter is going fast enough to become unbound from this system altogether, then yes, as time goes on, eventually you could have dark clouds that just don't have any baryonic matter in them at all. Although baryonic matter will then later accrete onto them and you'll probably end up with some in any way. What will probably happen in most cases is that this dark matter is not actually going sufficiently fast to escape 
from the system as a whole. And so if that happens, then over time, these dark matter clouds will fall back into the center just under the influence of gravity. And you will gradually equilibrate to some halo that looks like this. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, in principle, you could have clumps of dark matter that have no stars in them at all. Uh, and that would be a really interesting target for indirect detection searches, because if, if you saw light and visible particles coming from a region where you can't see any baryonic matter at all, then it might be telling you that dark matter collisions could produce those particles. You, but it's really, it would be really hard to find these clouds of dark matter, because the way we traditionally find dark matter is you, you look for stars that are orbiting in a way that is only well explained if there's a dark matter clump <laughs> there. And you can't do that if there are no stars. But you could potentially find them with gravitational lensing or with indirect searches. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Yeah. So you, you are anticipating my next point. Right. So there are a bunch of stars here, too. So when I say this actually, so this gives you an argument that it's dark matter, not modified gravity. But if you had dark, if you, and the argument for that relies on, we think most of the, if you compare the visible stars, the amount of visible gas, there's a lot more mass in the visible gas than the visible stars. But the dark matter here could be um, little black holes or something that behaves like stars and these collisionless like stars. Um, yeah. So yeah. And, and so you can actually, a test that you can do to see if the dark matter is really collisionless is, does the dark matter appear to line up with stars? Or is it like stars here? dark matter here, dark matter here, that kind of offset could provide evidence that dark matter actually has some self-interactions. Yeah, there are observations of stars from this system, and to a pretty good approximation, the dark matter lines up with the stars. Um, whether it exactly lines up with the stars, in not just this system, but in other systems as well, is an ongoing research question. There have been a few claims over the last few years of um, of seeing an offset between the dark matter and stars and people using that as claims of evidence for self-interacting dark matter. There's, um, there's some really recent work, as in I've seen it in conferences, but I haven't seen it in papers yet, which say that it's pretty, it's not that hard to get spurious offsets even when you think you have collisionless dark matter. Um, basically due to like, Basically, you like line of sight effects on your lensing. If you think two things are lined up and actually you're looking at different mass peaks, then it, you, you can think you have an offset where really you don't. But, um, but yeah, but that is, this is something that's a really active area of research to whether you can use offsets like this to try to see if the dark matter actually has self interactions. Yeah? This is, I think, the, there are, um, there are other, there are some, uh, there are some other observations like this. There are also cases where you don't really see this clean separation, and so then the question is, well, how consistent is that with CDM? I think at the moment the consensus is all the observations are at least consistent with CDM, but I think this is still the cleanest evidence of a big separation between the gas and the dark matter. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I've seen a couple of claims like that. I mean, it's hard, right? Because, I mean, this is an unusual event. Like, I mean, so the question is not, does this line up with the average from M-body simulations? It's like, how unlikely is a collision like this in an M-body simulation? If you do the statistics strong, you can mess this up. Um, so as, yeah, as far as I know, this hasn't gained a lot of interest as a serious problem for CDM. Um, but I'm not an expert on this area, on that particular question. Okay, good. All right, so yeah, in, in fact, this uh, covered a bunch of things that I was about to say next, which is, yeah, that you could use possible offsets between the stars and the mass peak and the gas as measurements of, so th this is evidence that there's something out there that is called dark matter that isn't just a modification of gravity of the gas, and the dark matter is at least approximately collisionless, by which we mean it doesn't interact as strongly as gas does. So now, so you can look at these offsets, but this should be, um, this should be done with some caution. So there's a reference on what kind of constraints on the cr interaction cross-section that you can get from this, um, from this kind of process, 
broadly speaking, so this paper says that this doesn't actually set a limit on the interaction cross sections, but the conventional wisdom is that this constrains interaction cross sec. So it's DM DM scattering that we're interested in here of order of the cross section divided by the mass of order one cent square centimeter per gram. However, this paper says that this. I write the tittle here for a reason. There are some older constraints that say that this rules out cross sections below about one centimeter squared per gram. This paper did some simulations with slightly higher cross sections where they simulated a bit more carefully and they said that this allows two centimeters squared per gram. So I think there is a twiddle around these constraints at the moment. So where does this number come from? Let's just understand why this is the right kind of scale to think about. For, um, for galaxies and galaxy clusters. Because this is going to be the same scale if you have self-interactions that are substantial on the scales of clusters and galaxy clusters, that could also potentially perturb the predictions of those M-body simulations that assume zero self-interactions. So, so let's just do a very quick back of the envelope estimate. Us what kind of self interaction cross sec do you need to perturb galaxies? By which I mean to, to have a significantly different behavior from, um, from, just from just assuming that it's not collisional at all. So, an estimate that you might make is you want the Scattering rate, you want an order one fraction of the dark matter particles to scatter within the time scale that you're interested in, okay? So in this case, that might be the collision time scale for these objects. If you're looking at the dynamics of a relaxed system of a galaxy, then you probably want the time scale to be the dynamical time. So, so we want the scattering rate, the average scattering rate to be to be like each jam particle scatters on average about once over the time of interest. So an order one fraction of the particles are going to scatter. So that corresponds to the number density of the dark matter times the cross section times the typical velocity of particles. This gives you the scattering rate, cross section times V. Just to check um, how many people in the street, when I say cross section, is that a meaningful term to you? Raise your hands if so. Okay, good, just, just checking. Like, this is the same cross-sections that we're talking about at colliders and, and so on. Okay, so this is a measure of the scattering rate. So dark matter density times, so this is the scattering rate for an individual dark matter particle. This is the rate of one over time. We want this to be, this times the time to be one. We want the scattering rate for a DM particle to be one over tau. So this number density of dark matter, this is gonna be like the mass, th we know the mass density of dark matter. This is what affects gravitation. So we know this much better than we know the number density. I'm gonna use chi as my symbol for dark matter. So this means the mass density of dark matter. This means the mass of dark matter. The ratio gives me the number density. So I was saying that sigma over m of the dark matter. So this is the dm mass. This is what gets constrained and we can now immediately see why. So the, tip, the, cross sec, the threshold cross section that you need here is going to be like one over tau times V times rho chi. So if we say, so you know, so, suppose we look at a, um, suppose we look at a galaxy uh, similar to the Milky Way or similar to a dwarf galaxy of the Milky Way. So the local dark matter density in the Milky Way has been measured so near Earth, let's just use this as a calibration. The local density of dark matter is measured to be about 0.4 GV per cubic centimeter. The typical velocity of dark matter is a few hundred 
kilometers per second. So this is like 10 to the minus 3 times C. Um, now, if you were in close to the galactic center where you want to see these modifications, then rho would be somewhat higher. And, um, well, and we know the rotation curve is pretty flat. But, you know, so let's just, order of magnitude estimates, let's just say 1 GV per cubic centimeter here. And the dynamical time to like make changes to the structure of the Milky Way is about a billion years. So if you put in numbers like this, then what you end up getting is that this sigma over m chi ends up coming out as somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.1 to one centimeters squared per gram, given that we're close enough to lunch, I won't make you do the unit conversion. But um, okay, so, but you see, so thi this sort of scale, this is why, similar argument to this is why bullet cluster collisions and so on, set constraints around one centimeter squared per gram, put in your dynamical time here, maybe for a collision like this, it's only a few million years rather than a billion years, but, but the velocities, um, but the velocities are much higher more like 3,000 kilometers per second. So you're going to get a power there, and the densities can, somewhat be somewhat, can be somewhat higher. But this is the ballpark that you're looking at for constraints on dark matter self-interaction from galactic dynamics or from colliding clusters. Now, I don't know about you, but um, for me, centimeters squared per gram is an extremely unnatural and horrible unit to work in. <laughs> I'm thinking about particle physics. So if we put in the factors of h bar and c, and we asked what would this correspond to in you know, like sensible in like particle physicist units. Well, centimeters have units of inverse mass, right? Grams have units of inverse mass, and mass is the same as energy. So you can work this out, and this comes out to correspond to a mass scale of about, so this has units of one over mass times one over mass times one over mass to one over mass cubed. This turns out to correspond to a scale of about 100 MeV. So, this is actually quite a large cross-section. Like if you had 100 MeV particles colliding, this is a QCD, like this is a QCD scale, okay? So when we say dark matter is collisionless, we really mean like collisionless at the level that it doesn't interact more strongly than QCD. So <laughs> dark matter could actually be reasonably collisional without affecting a lot of the predictions of M-body simulations. But we would see those kinds of cross-sections starting to show up with the data that we have now in cluster collisions and potentially in the small scale problems of CDM. Questions about this? Yeah? Sorry, what, what? Okay, so this was, th yeah, so, so this is an estimate like if I wanted to, so this would be like the dynamical time of the Milky Way. So this is broadly, um, this is, if, if I make, it, so, okay. Let me unpack this a little bit more. So imagine, so for something like the bullet cluster, the time scale that you want here is not the dynamical time for the Milky Way, it would be the time for the collision to go through. Um, but these collisions aren't super fast, so it, it's, it's not gonna be that many orders of magnitude smaller than this. If what you want to ask is, let's try to solve the small scale structure problems of CDM, then what you want to know is, if my dark matter particles are or are all bouncing off each other, and that's changing the evolution of the dark matter particles. How does that compare to the other time scales in your simulation? Like how does it compare to the time scale for if I perturb the potential, how long does it take to relax back to the original configuration? Okay, so th that's what I mean when I say I, I talk about a dynamical time of the galaxy. Suppose I put in some perturbation, I want to know how long it takes to converge back to its original, uh, how long it takes me to you know, relax back to the original equilibrium configuration. So for a, for a dwarf galaxy, that's in the order of a billion years. You know it can't be more than about 10 billion years because that's the lifetime of the universe. Um, you, to convince yourself that it shouldn't be drastically shorter than that, um, you, yeah, you, you may need to do some actual simulations. Yeah, I think it's also, you can work out, I don't know if I can do this in real time, but the time that, it, I mean, I think it's, yeah, okay, no, I, I won't say that because I'm not sure I can confirm it in real time, but um, I think that, I think that if you work out the time that it takes for like something that's the Earth's radius to go all the way around the galaxy, then it's not dramatically far from this. 
either. So it's also unit similar. I mean, all these galaxy formation, galaxy modification time scales are in the same ballpark. But yeah, but but basically, it's it's a question of, okay, I have time scales in my problem that come from these particles are moving around within some gravitational potential. They're going to asymptote to some particular density configuration within that gravitational potential. If I give them some self interactions. Um, in order for it to have a meaningful effect on their distribution, I need the time scale for those self interactions to change the distribution to be um, shorter than the time scale for just the gravitational interactions to change the distribution. So that's the comparison. All right. So we have some evidence now that dark matter is there, that it surrounds galaxies and galaxy clusters, that assuming non-collisionality is a reasonably good approximation for what we have so far, but there might be some hints for collisionality at this level, at this sort of 0.1 to 1 centimeter squared per gram, which is around, around the region that is being constrained by current bounds. But as we said earlier, you could still potentially have dark matter that was I haven't given you much evidence so far that dark matter isn't stuff like stars, stuff that is collisionless because it's a bunch of individual heavy objects that just don't have a very large number density. So the other key piece of evidence for dark matter, and one of the very most powerful pieces of evidence in terms of excluding explanations, comes from the surface of large scattering, which you talked about in the previous lecture, and the cosmic microwave background radiation, which Tony was talking about this morning. So, well, part of what I was going to say Tony said this morning, so but I'll say it again, just uh, to emphasize it. So our universe is expanding and cooling over time. In the very early universe, you had a plasma of protons, of electrons, of neutrinos and pot potentially of dark matter. Now, at around when the temperature of the universe was around 0.3 eV, this does not correspond to 2.7 Kelvin. It turns out if you work it out, it corresponds to about 2,700 Kelvin. So this corresponds to a redshift of around, a redshift factor of about 1,000. So light coming from that time has been redshifted by a factor of 1,000 by the time it gets to us. The ionization level dropped by orders of magnitude at that point, and the cosmic microwave background radiation gives us a snapshot of what the universe looked like back then. Now, so um, Tony talked about the incredible isotropy of the CMB, the fact that it looks like the same temperature everywhere. But there are anisotropies in the CMB and they hold a lot of information. So if you think about what the universe looked like immediately before this epoch, well, so we had a plasma of photons, electrons, and protons, which were all tightly coupled to each other. These are charged particles. They were efficiently scattering off the photons and then plus the neutrinos, which were decoupled by that point, and potentially plus dark matter. Now, um, in this plasma, now there were perturbations in the metric and in all of these fluids, perturbations to density and temperature. To a first approximation, we believe the universe was just homogeneous then. It basically had a constant density everywhere. This was way before stars, way before galaxies. But we believe that there were perturbations to the density and temperature of these fluids left over from inflation, which we'll be hearing about in the subsequent lectures. So we can see those perturbations today when we get a snapshot of the universe at these early times the cosmic microwave background is extremely homogeneous across the sky but the level of 10 to the minus 5 so one part in 100,000 there are 
fluctuations which tell us exactly about these perturbations of density and temperature at early times. But these perturbations were not static at early times in particular. So suppose I've got this configuration, I've got this plasma of photons and massive particles in the early universe, and suppose I have some regions where the density is a bit higher than other regions. So what's the effect of gravity going to be on those perturbations? We've got some region that's a bit denser than the others, just from gravitational effects. Other particles are going to want to fall onto that over density. Okay, they're going to be gravitationally attracted towards it. So there are so these perturbations oscillate. But why would I say they oscillate? I just said gravity causes once I have an over density gravity will cause the density to increase. If I have an under density, gravitational effects will cause the density to decrease, right? The particles in that region will be pulled away to other regions of higher density. So this doesn't sound like an oscillation. This just sounds like a runaway process. So what, um, what makes it an oscillation? If I have this over density, this region where I've got a lot of photons, a lot of charged particles, and, um, and gravity is pulling them together, what happens next? Yeah, that's right. So I'm going to input. I'm going to have radiation pressure, which, when gravity tries to pull these together, the radiation pressure is going to push them back apart. So that fuels an oscillation in all of these modes that is driven on one hand by gravity, and on the other hand by radiation pressure. So. Um, I'm not going to go through this calculation in depth. If you are interested, you can do it at various levels of depth. Um, Wayne, whose website has a bunch of really clear explanations of how this works physically, I can also talk through it with anyone who's interested. If you want to ask about it in this afternoon's lecture, then um, you can get more information there. But basically, anisotropies of the CMB today probe this oscillation pattern. And this oscillation pattern is different depending on whether you have dark matter or not. Because what we mean by dark matter is matter that feels gravity but doesn't feel radiation pressure. So when we find that we can explain the observations of the anisotropies really well, but explaining those observations require that we must have a component that experiences only gravity and not radiation pressure. So we have a dark matter component that essentially sets potential wells, and the dark matter is just steadily accreting in those, potentially, in those potential wells, while the photon baryon plasma is oscillating in them. So the baryons feel radiation pressure too. So the cosmic microwave background allows us to measure both the amount of matter that interacts with radiation which we conventionally call baryons even though you know this includes the electrons and protons and helium nuclei that are hanging out as well. It allows us to separately measure the amount of matter that fills both of these and the amount of matter that interacts only gravitationally. And we can measure both of these to percent level precision. At least gravitationally only within the approximations of this calculation. Those self-interaction cross-sections that I told you about earlier, it counts as gravitationally only for these purposes. Um, so, and we can measure both of these to percent level precision. And what we find is that dm has to be about 26% of the critical density of the universe 
which is about five to six times as much as the matter that interacts with radiation as well. Now, this tells us a bunch of really interesting things. First, it gives us a hard number for how much dark matter there is in the universe. As you'll see in the next lecture, this is a really important controlling factor on models for what dark matter could be. If as a theorist you want to come up with a dark matter model, you have to have an explanation for why is there this much of it. Second, it tells us that already at rate shift 1,000, the universe at this point was, about, it was only a few hundred thousand years old. Already at that point, we, have dark, we had dark matter. Now, it's not guaranteed that the dark matter back then is the same as the dark matter that we see around galaxies today, but embody simulations using the CMB essentially as initial conditions, saying suppose you had that much dark matter back then, let's evolve forward and see how much you would have today. They agree with the observations pretty well. So Occam's razor is what we're seeing around galaxies today is the same as this stuff back here. It tells you dark matter can't be burnt out stars or planetoids or anything like that. It has to have already been around long before any stars were formed in, early, in the early universe, long before galaxies came along. So if so the dark matter really has to be a relic of the early universe, whatever it was, it was already there after a few hundred thousand years. And yeah, it, it tells you, you know, just any idea. So this is also a significant challenge to models of modified gravity. And this is, I think, the strongest challenge. You can maybe explain the bullet cluster if you introduce some dark baryons or something else that is dark matter in the sense that it's non-luminous, but not dark matter in the sense that it requires new physics. But explaining this cosmological observation that at redshift 1000, you had something that what you had some matter component, some non-relativistic matter components, so not neutrinos that wasn't interacting with the radiation. That's really quite hard, and I don't know of an existence proof yet. Yeah, so it's, um, y yeah, so to, to really understand what Mon should be doing in the early universe, you probably want some complete theory of, you, you know, you want some theory of Mon in which you, um, in, in which you can define what happened with the cosmology at early times. I mean, yeah, it's true, you, you can just say, okay, let's suppose that the gravitational effect of everything changes by this amount, but I mean, it's, it's not, this is a very different situation to gravity around galaxies and stuff, right? Because, I mean, th these overdensities are not isolated objects. It, they're small perturbations on a bath that is largely uniform. So there have been several attempts to try to extend Mond to a theory from which you can work out the cosmology. There's um, TEVES, which is like tensor vector scalar theories. Um, and, and so, I mean, you can make predictions for the CMB in these theories. You can do that. Um, I'm not yet aware of a successful prediction that gets this right without introducing another field, which is basically dark matter. So, um, I mean, you, you can introduce, so, I mean, a thing that you can do is say, introduce something that at the CMB epoch works like dark matter, and then say, but there's Mon, and that's what's responsible for rotation curves in the present day. So you basically decouple the dark matter-like thing that lets you get the CMB right and the thing that lets you explain the rotation curves in the present day. Yeah, yeah, so, so you can maybe do something like that. But I think it's, I, please, if you have an ex existence proof that works for this, then let me know. But um, the last time I did a search through the literature, there wasn't anything that like, just cleanly explained it all in the same framework. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, you, so you can put this in. You can ask um, if I include, so, I mean, because you might say, oh, well, but it, this is an interaction with radiation, so, you know, I mean, it, da is dark matter interacting with itself? So could that still act as dark matter to describe the CMB accurately, but it could have some second order effects on the dark matter perturbations? Um, my memory is that there is a constraint on dark matter self-interaction from the CMB, and it's a lot weaker than the limits that you, that you get from present day galaxies. Um, that's my memory. But yeah, if you had a, if you had a sufficiently strong self-interaction cross-section so that the dark matter was 
really behaving like a strongly self-interacting fluid at the time of the CMB with its own perturbations, then, I mean, you would, you would put extra terms into the evolution of the perturbations that took that into account. I'm sure you can put a constraint on dark matter self-interaction cross-section from that. But, but I think the kinds of levels that people, well, I mean, I think the kinds of levels that people typically talk about in the context of galaxies, um, you don't expect to see much effect on the CMB. Okay, so I believe it is, I believe it is lunchtime. So let me, uh, okay. So 